Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 scandalous events from the Middle Ages, part three. This one's dark, a lot of punishments. Here we go. Kicking off the list at number 10, the heretic's fork. Ah, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck, right off the bat. Here we go. The heretic's fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst, in my opinion, because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment, and then no one has to even be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty, horrible fork would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight or else the obvious and horrible would happen. Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The heretic's fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device. Yeah, it was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also, don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties, but finally this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose, Think again, pal, that's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. Wouldn't be done. Krakows, or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's feet? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, a squire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back in your burks and socks. Number six. Solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. Here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. 
Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones, it was pitch black, it was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did, and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone, no thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows, maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying. Number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible. Get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Yeah, that's history. Those are the top 10 scandalous events from the Middle Ages part three. If you want a part four, I'll do it. I'll do it for you guys, that's fine. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and I'll see you next time on Bumblebee. Peace.